You don't want to wake the dragon, do you? No. One of the great mysteries in A Song of Ice and Fire is how did Danny hatch her dragons? Here's what George R. R. Martin had to say about that. Quote, the whole point of the scene in A Game of Thrones where Daenerys hatches the dragons is that she makes the magic up as she goes along. She is someone who might do anything. I wanted magic to be something barely under control and half instinctive. In the show, we get some hints as to what happened. Tell me again exactly what it was that you saved. Your life. But in the books, we get a lot more. Specifically, her dragon dreams, her thoughts, and her fever dream after giving birth. And George has said that he gave us clues if you read carefully. So after rereading all of her chapters in book one four times in the last few days, I think I got it. First, let's look at the timeline. The Valyrian Empire goes back 5 to 8,000 years. The Doom of Valyria happened about 400 years ago. Aegon's Conquest happened 300 years ago, and the last Targaryen dragon died around 150 years ago. Some fans believe that there are dragons in the Shadowlands beyond Ashai due to one of Bran's visions, but from the perspective of everyone in Westeros, no dragon has hatched in 150 years. Until Daenerys Stormborn came along and the night came alive with the music of dragons. In order to understand how she did it, let's first look at how dragons hatched in the past. Targaryens used to place dragon eggs in the cribs of newborns, and sometimes those eggs hatched. Sometimes they did not, and it was taken as a bad omen for that child. But our major takeaway from those hatchings is that they did not require blood sacrifices. And some dragon eggs hatched in the wild, naturally so to say. Granted, the dragon mothers and fathers may have been singing the right songs, we don't know. But what we do know is that no eggs have hatched in 150 years, and people have tried many things. Heating eggs, praying to the gods, saying spells, wildfire, and accidental blood sacrifices like we saw at the tragedy of Summerhall. But unfortunately, none of that worked. Then Danny is born, Daenerys Stormborn, and she was not named that because there was some thunder and lightning outside. Danny was born during the biggest storm in the history of Westeros. You know that saying, words are wind? People often use that nowadays as a way of saying, don't tell me, show me. But just like the phrase the North remembers, I think the true meaning of the phrase, words are wind, has been forgotten. There's evidence that people's souls flow into nature after they die. And Blood Raven tells Bran that if you try to speak to someone from within a vision, all they'll hear is a whisper of wind. So when you read the books or when you watch the show, keep your eyes and ears out for wind. Because wind may be the words of dead people or green seers. And since Danny was born during the biggest storm ever, it seems like the dead had a lot to say about her birth, which makes sense, and so far, she fits the prophecy of Azor Ahai better than anyone else. So on her wedding day, Magister Illyrio gives her three dragon eggs from the Shadowlands beyond the Shy. He claims that they are stone, implying that the dragons within are dead, and I believe him. We'll get back to this once we get to the hatching. As she travels around Essos, Danny begins to have dragon dreams that foreshadow the eventual birth of the dragons in a big fire. The dragon eggs feel warm to her at times, even though the eggs feel cold to others. She has hallucinations while she's awake, and she even gains strength from the dragon eggs as she transitions from a meek, scared, abused, and lonely girl to a brave, determined, and fierce girl with the dragon's temper. Do not talk back to me. <laughs> You are a horse lord slut, and now you've woken the dragons. The next time you raise a hand to me will be the last time you have hands. Meanwhile, she's pregnant with an unborn child whom she named Rago, and she could feel Rago moving inside of her, reaching out to the dragon eggs as if he's speaking to them brother to brother, blood to blood. But eventually, Khal Drogo suffers an injury and Mary Mazdor sabotages him. It's hard to blame her. His character is captivating, but when you think about it, he was kind of a crappy dude. His callous are killed, raped, enslaved, and sold people as slaves. Look at the pile of heads right here. The people they killed were basically farmers. It's disgusting. He's a savage, of course, but he's one of the finest killers alive. Moreover, Khal Drogo's son was prophesied to be the stallion to mount the world, the stallion is the Karl of Cows. He shall unite the people into a single Kalasar. All the people of the world will be his herd. Sounds pretty awful for team life. A lot like the goal of someone else we know. 
As Mary is working her dark magic, singing secret songs, calling forth death to the realms of man, Khaleesi goes into labor, and there are no other healers left, so Danny's friends bring her to Miri, and that's when things get interesting. Danny's child is born a dragon. They say the child was... Monstrous. He was scaled like a lizard, with leather wings like the wings of a bat. A little dragon that had already been dead for years. This is not the first time a Targaryen has given birth to a deformed dragon-like creature. But the thing is, we have plenty of evidence earlier in the story that the baby was alive inside of her. She felt it kicking many times. And as she goes into labor, she feels it kicking inside of her once again. But this time, it felt like knives, indicating something has changed. It was no longer a baby. It was a dragon. So here's my take. Miri thinks that she used Rago's life in a dark song that left Caldrogo as a vegetable, but really, she used the horse's life, as was originally planned. Rago's life was accidentally exchanged for the life of one of the dead dragons, which is why Danny ended up giving birth to a dragon that had been dead for years. But Danny doesn't find this out right away, because after her birth, she falls into a dragon dream for a long time, possibly days, and George wrote this dream with a very interesting structure. As she travels through the dream, Danny periodically hears the words, you don't want to wake the dragon, do you? Two separate times. And then it shortens to, don't want to wake the dragon, do you? Two times. Then, you don't want to wake the dragon, twice more. Then, want to wake the dragon, then wake the dragon, then the dragon, and the dragon is born. Not hatched yet, but alive inside the egg, and figuratively speaking, inside of herself. She's a changed girl. She's the last dragon. Anna was Zavek. In the show, she wakes up and asks about the baby right away. My son. Where is he? I want him. But in the books, it's very different. She wakes up and crawls towards the eggs. Then they give her something to drink and she passes back out. She wakes up a second time and asks about the eggs. Again, they gave her something and she passes out. The third time she wakes up, she is holding Viserion's egg and she finally asks about Khal Drogo. And then she asks about her baby. She questions herself, why did it take me so long to think about Rago, my child? And then she realizes that she already knew he was dead. She had seen it in her fever dream, a dragon dream. And one can argue that this sacrifice was her choice. This was foreshadowed back when she first received the eggs. Every gift comes with a price. I warned you that only death can pay for life. You knew the price. Now Viserion's egg feels warm to her, but it still feels cold to Ser Jorah. So clearly, we're not there yet. Let's keep going. So Danny does not shed a tear for Rago because her tears had already been turned to steam in her dragon dream. Miri admits to sabotaging Khal Drogo and Rago as revenge, saving the world from being destroyed by them. He would have been the stallion who mounts the world. Now he will burn no cities. Now his Khalasar will trample no nations into dust. Danny then puts the Khal out of his misery and plans phase two, Hatch the Dragons. A comet is seen overhead, which she takes as a good sign. But the comet means one thing, boy. Dragons. Dragons are all dead. Been dead for centuries. She then sets up a pyre with Khal Drogo, Miri Mazdor, and another horse. As it goes up in flame, Miri starts singing a song, which probably was an attempt to protect herself from the fire. But it does not work, at least not for her. In the show, Danny's fireproof. But in the books, many fans believe that the fire protection spell transferred from Miri over to Danny, because being a Targaryen does not automatically make you fireproof. Uh -huh. So Miri dies. Danny has more visions. She sees many things and more. Khal Drogo appears to ride away on a fiery horse into the Nightlands, and the dragon eggs begin to hatch with loud, cracking sounds. These sounds are similar to the lore about the origin of dragons. That once there were two moons in the sky. But one wandered too close to the sun and it cracked from the heat. And out of it poured a thousand thousand dragons. The first egg to crack is Viserion, and the second is presumably Rhaegal, because the third crack is as loud and as sharp as the breaking of the world, most likely Drogon. When the flames die out, they find Danny naked and hairless, but unhurt. Viserion and Rhaegal are drinking milk from her chest, and Drogon is on her shoulders. He is the first to hiss, a clear sign that he is the dominant dragon and the dragon most closely bonded to Danny. So there are two key events here, giving the dragons life and hatching them. In order to give them life, there were three blood sacrifices, Rago, Miri Mazdor, and Khal Drogo. And in order to hatch them, Danny did two things. First, she never looked back. I don't want you alone with this sorceress. 
I have nothing more to fear from this woman. You don't understand. Don't ask me to stand aside as you climb on that pyre. I won't watch you burn. Is that what you fear? This concept of self-belief, or the law of attraction as I called it in the Jon Snow resurrection video, it's key. It's not enough by itself, but it's definitely a mandatory ingredient. Proof are the six times in her final two chapters that she hears her own voice tell her, if I look back, I am lost. Further evidence is that right before she walks into the fire, she declares three of her Dothraki her blood riders. They all deny her, saying she's a woman. But she just keeps turning and speaking in the next one, completely ignoring them. It's pretty funny. You really have to read the chapter to get what I'm saying, but basically she's in the zone. She won't take no for an answer. And last, she hears Jorah screaming while she's in the fire, and she wishes she could shout out to him, Can't you see? Can't you see? I am Daenerys Stormborn, daughter of dragons, bride of dragons, mother of dragons. And here's the last ingredient, and my favorite, love. Stay with me. I'm not just being corny. Both Sir Jorah and Prince Rhaegar won a single tourney that shaped their lives. And they won those respective tourneys by leveraging the power of love. Those were special one-time events. Jorah acknowledges Danny's love for Khal Drogo right before she enters the fire. She apologizes to him inside her head several times, and hidden away in the second to last chapter is the important line of them all, and possibly my favorite line from the entire series now that I found it. Danny thinks to herself, quote, There are powers stronger than hatred, and spells older and truer than any the Meiji had learned in Ashai, implying love. So the comet, blood sacrifice, and self-belief were prerequisites. But it's not your screams I want. Only your life. But as she walks into the flames and calls for her children, plural, she summons the oldest and most powerful spell of them all, love. And for the first time in hundreds of years, the night came alive with the music of dragons.